Welcome everybody to our uh, inaugural lecture in our Circle Summer uh, Speaker Series. This is an effort by the Young Adults of Deanery 2, all the characters of Palo Alto, Mountain View, and Los Altos, uh, to bring in prominent speakers to address topics that are of importance to young adults. And I can't think of a better speaker to start us rolling than the man you're going to hear tonight. Father Kevin Joyce is very active in our diocese, especially with young adult ministry. He has given several talks at uh, Theology on Tap, the most recent in March, uh, a talk entitled Angels, Demons, and Exorcisms, where we found out he is trained as an exorcist. Okay, and I, I trust you, we won't be seeing a demonstration of those abilities tonight. I, I hope not. Okay, uh, Father Joyce was ordained in 1980. Uh, he was, received his Ph.D. In, in Spirituality from Catholic University in 1991. He's the founder and director of SpiritSight, spiritsight.org. That is the spirituality center of the Diocese of San Jose. Okay, and tonight his uh, talk will be titled, With All Due Apologies to Simon and Garfunkel, The Seven Deadly Sins, Still Deadly After All These Years. Father Jones. <laughs> The uh, topic is, for some reason, uh, fascinating to people all over the place. But the first time I was asked to give a talk on the Seven Deadly Sins to a group of young adults was at the Theology on Tap. First time I'd ever given a presentation at a bar. And uh, I was quite nervous, frankly, because I thought, they're going to laugh me off the stage. I'm going to get up on the stage. There's about 200 young adults there. It's a pretty big bar, Scott and Murphy's Irish pub in, in Sunnydale. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I'm going to be talking. To, they're all drinking and eating, and I'm going to be talking about gluttony and drunkenness. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, really, I was I was uh, I was pretty uh, nervous about the whole event. Then I find out when I get to the bar, I got there slightly late. The place was really packed. They had already been quaffing quite a few Guinnesses by the time I got there, so it was very loud. And then I see that there's. Senator Mercury News is there, and they've got a photographer and Joe Rodriguez, you know, they're, uh, one of their uh, uh, writers. And, uh, no, I mean, this is, I am not, this is, I'm not an expert at this, I've never done this before, I'm nervous, and, and they're going to, I'm going to look like a fool, they're going to write that he was a fool, you know. And, <laughs> so anyway, I, I started off with that, with that kind of uh, attitude. But really, it's not a bad way to start, because when you can't depend on yourself, you have to depend on somebody else, right? So I just uh, made a quick prayer to the Holy Spirit and uh, launched ahead. And it was amazing. After about 30 seconds, this din just became totally silent. It seemed like that there was this strong interest in this whole question. I started off with blood and drunkenness. And, uh, <clears throat> and we went on for two hours. It was, uh, it was really quite a lively session. A lot of questions and discussion. And, wrestling with the, the issues, because anybody who has an ounce of self-knowledge is aware that he or she is dealing with at least one, and probably more, of the afflictions that we call the deadly sins. Every human being, I think, is wrestling with, with one or more of them. Now, on your, on your paper there, you have the uh, list, the classic list. But you notice that the list of the sins is the third list. There are two lists uh, preceding that. And the reason is that what we now call in the Christian tradition the seven deadly sins was a later teaching. It was not the original teaching. The original teaching comes, well, actually from the New Testament. You can find it all in the New Testament. But systematized in the fourth century with the desert fathers and desert mothers. And some of you probably know something about them. This was a whole movement uh, out into the deserts of Egypt and Palestine and Syria in the uh, 200s and 300s, first because of the persecution against Christianity by the Roman Empire, and then because the church got too cozy with the, with the empire. And so in the 300s, when Christianity was legal, there still were thousands of people going off to these desert communities seeking a deeper Christian life. Because they found that uh, too many of the clergy were really kind of uh, embedded with the uh, political leaders and the emperor. And they wanted a more radical 
kind of Christianity. It was much more evangelical, much more rooted in the life of Jesus himself and the witness of the first generation of Christians. So this movement to the deserts, it was a lay movement. There weren't very many priests in, in, in that uh, group. This became eventually institutionalized as monasticism. But originally, these were not monks and nuns. These were lay people, some of them married. Some of them actually brought families with them. They established little communities in Egypt, and Palestine, Syria. And uh, they worked for a living, in usually in some kind of manual labor, sold their wares, and spent significant time in uh, prayer and meditation and hospitality. There were no retreat centers in those days. So these little colonies, or sometimes just little hermitages, would provide uh, spiritual direction to people who were seeking uh, help in their spiritual journey. This movement really formed the foundation of most of subsequent Eastern and Western Christian spirituality. So many of the fundamental teachings that we have even today in the contemporary books in the era of spirituality find their roots not only in the New Testament, but then in the writings of the Desert Fathers. So that's a a, lo a long-winded background to the first list. The first list, thoughts. The desert, uh, we'll, we'll just call them the desert elders, these men and women we call them desert fathers and mothers. So these desert elders had uh, a great deal of self-scrutiny as part of their daily routine. They spent, you know, probably a few hours a day in meditation and reading the scriptures and reflecting on their life and, and examining their conscience. And, and they realized that there, that, that there is a main obstacle in one's spiritual development. The number one obstacle, what do you think they pretty much universally came up with as the number one obstacle? Take a guess, mm -hmm. random guess. An obstacle to meditating, you mean? An obstacle to the spiritual life, to the spiritual journey. Hunger. Temper, okay. Hunger. Oh, hunger. Yeah, it wasn't just a food. <laughs> That's a very logical guess. <laughs> Any other guesses? Yeah. Anger. Anger, okay. Anything else? Ego. Ego. All good guesses. Sin. Sin. Oh. Another good guess. None of which were what they came up with. Themselves? They said the main obstacle to the spiritual journey, the main obstacle to being a healthy human being, is thought. Thoughts. Thoughts that become, you got that? Yeah. That become obsessions. Thoughts that become addictions. Afflictions of the soul is a term that they would use. And these thoughts, if we don't deal with them in an intelligent way, with wisdom, become deadly. And that's how we end up 200 years later, about 200 years, with the tradition of the seven deadly sins. But the original tradition from the 300s was a, a tradition about thoughts. The person who really systematized this teaching was a kind of like a roving reporter. He was a monk, but he was kind of like a Barbara Walters or a Tom Brokaw of his day. And he was going around interviewing monks or these elders out there in the hermitages, these little colonies. And um, his name was John Cashin. He's considered a saint in the Eastern Church, St. John Cashin. And he spent years as a, as a monk and then traveled and interviewed and wrote very thick book called The Conferences, a whole series of conferences that he gave to aspiring monks. And he wrote another one called The uh, Institutes. Anyway, the section that I'm dealing with today is one of his conferences on these thoughts. In fact, you can get the original text. Uh, you can buy his big, this huge book called The, called the Conferences of John Cashin. Or you can get just that one particular um, has to do a section, a chapter that's in an anthology called the Philokalia. And if you're all interested in Eastern Christianity, the Philokalia is next to the Bible, the most important uh, series of writings they have. There's four volumes that have been translated into English. And they are basically an anthology of writings of great saints of the Eastern Church, including John Cashin. So in volume one, you'll find the, uh, it's not very long, it's only 20 pages or so. And it's simply called, it's simply called On the Eight Vices. <laughs> See, the original tradition, but there are eight vices, not seven. But 200 years later, Pope Gregory the Great uh, 
felt that because seven is the perfect number in the scriptures, the number of completion and wholeness, there should be seven deadly sins, not eight. So he combined vainglory and pride into one, and he called 